like winning the lottery to be a working, to be a working actor consistently. It's a very difficult. Thing. I think that certainly when you play a villain and you have no sort of responsibility to, you know, the sort of moral center of the plot. That was a very big turning point for me as an actor because I think it was the first time that I felt truly responsible for something.莱昂纳多·迪卡普里奥是好莱坞的一个特例。他拥有精致、帅气、高大的外表。二十三岁，凭借主演《泰坦尼克》就红遍全球，成为中国观众最熟悉的好莱坞明星。但好莱坞巨
has his dominion over, you know, many human lives, but there's also an integration of the fact that he's been raised by these people too. He is, he is connected to them, and his only father figure is a black man, yet he's a severe racist, and he's a slave owner. And, and I think by him sort of taking the chances that he took with this, um, with this screenplay and bringing all these other different elements of life to it, he brought almost a different type of truth that uh, really rung true with me and, and all the characters. I can see that part of the most strike me is the scene at the dining room table. Even today, I vividly presented it. At that time, I just want to know is how much is improvised? How much come from what's the preparation you have done to lead to that great performance in that? That scene and that sequence in particular was something that was talked about a lot between Tarantino and myself. Because there were two different sort of factions of, of racism at that time where the justification for being that severely racist, one was religious, one was using the Bible and saying, look, we are an endemic race, we are the pure race, and you are not. And the other one was from a scientific perspective, yeah, which was this, this sort of pseudoscience that was called phrenology was one of them. And I learned a lot about phrenology early on, and I, I proposed the idea of my character becoming a sort of pseudo-scientist and thinking that he's an expert in phrenology and how the skull works and why one man is superior to the other. And I sent um, Quentin a lot of information on that. And the brilliant thing about working with somebody like Quentin Tarantino is that he is a writer-director, and that is a huge difference. You, uh, everything is all encompassed in one. You don't need to go to different departments. There's one man, you say, look, this is what I'm passionate about with the character. This is what I feel will connect him and make him make sense to me. And two weeks later, I had this, you know, three page sort of monologue about how, you know, Calvin sees the world. And I got to, uh, you know, I got to have this, this uh, sort of beautiful bit of dialogue to, to play with. And that, you know, that, that whole sequence took a week and it was um, incredibly intense. And we talked, and I talked about the idea of maybe actually carving a skull in front of them and showing them like a real scientist would and it turned into a really cool sequence. If I was holding the skull of, a, of, a, of an Isaac Newton or, or Galileo, these three dimples would be found in the area of the skull most associated with creativity. But there's the skull of old man. And in the skull of old man, Unburdened by genius. These three dimples exist in the area of the skull most associated with civility. It's harder to play hero or play villain. Which one more exciting or is or is totally different? Is it just for you? I don't know. I mean, sometimes it's very difficult to... It, there are different types of, of challenges. I think that certainly when you play the villain and you have no sort of responsibility to you know, the sort of moral center of the plot and you're completely narcissistic and indulgent and only care about yourself. I mean, that's what certainly Calvin Candy was. He was just absorbing everything that was wonderful in life and, and having fun. And that, that, that becomes very, you know, exciting to do as an actor. Freedom. There is more freedom in it because you're not beholden to the sort of structure of the movie. You're not the moral center piece. You're, you're sort of free to play. But there's also an equal challenge to, you know, playing the, uh, playing the sort of the, the moral center of a movie because you have so much more to think about, I think. Uh, you know, you have to take the whole film into consideration. But yeah, I mean, that's why traditionally a lot of actors have said that it's a lot more fun to play the movie. <laughs> 莱昂纳多饰演一名骄横、残暴的南方种植园园主。在电影中，对黑人奴隶有大量辱骂性与严格暴力行为，触碰到美国文化中的敏感神经。无论是莱昂纳多还是导演昆汀，都因此面临着
you know, concerned and afraid on how it's going to be, you know, presented to an audience. And here, you know, Quentin not only took on the issue of slavery, which is sort of very taboo in our country, and it's something that is a very, you know, very sensitive issue. It's a raw nerve in America still, because it's still prevalent. We still have racism, and there's still all these issues, uh, you know, percolating in our country. So, you know, if you, if you take the wrong angle with it, you know, uh, it could offend a lot of people. But I think that what was incredibly courageous is that he decided to make it this spaghetti western with humor. And he decided to treat it as a part of American folklore and something that, you know, we as a society need to, uh, you know, almost like a mirror, look back on ourselves and say, this is where we came from. It's not something that should be ignored. And let's see the dark side of it. Let's see the humor that's involved with it. Let's let's entertain an audience as well. Uh, you have these African-American uh, top factor, uh, Samuel Jackson and uh, Jimmy Fox and Kerry Washington. And, uh, there's, you guys need to have a complete trust and a culprit in order to accomplish this very yeah. sensitive and yet intense movies. Uh, would you share a little bit on the side how you guys work together? The second I went on set, uh, you know, I sort of swallowed the fact that I was going to have to be treating treating some of my favorite actors <laughs> in a certain way that I admire so much. I mean, uh, and 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 um, treating them as less than me or inhuman was a very difficult. Uh, uh, thing hurdle for me to jump over, but like 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 with any role, once you sort of grasp who that character is, then he, it just become takes on a life of its own, and you run with it. And I sort of became him, and um, it was uh, an interesting shoot. You know, there were some s sequences in the movie where I was like, "Wow, we are really going, uh, we're going the distance on this. We're really pushing the envelope as far as the intensity and the violence of some of the." things that go on, went on during this era, do we need to go there? I posed the question. And immediately both of them said, you know, the travesty or the disservice that you could do to this issue is to not, is to not go that, that far. If you pull punches, if you sugarcoat yes. this issues, if you try to make it, uh, you know, less severe, people will ultimately resent it. And that made a lot of sense to me. And Marshall and the bitches send off Tanya to nigga him. It really surprised me what the hip hop music doing in this spaghetti western. I was really, but it, it works. You know, Quentin has always toyed ever since we've seen it in you know Reservoir Dogs, yes. Pulp Fiction. He's always. The cutting ears. Yeah, he's very cutting edge, and he's, he's always toying with the with the medium of filmmaking, and and I, those things are always a great surprise to me. You never really know what you're gonna expect when you see Quentin Tarantino, but whether it be the music or whether it be you know Uma Thurman doing Square, and there's a square in the in the middle of this film, and it, it's he's uh he's somebody that takes music as seriously too as he does as he does his filmmaking, and there was always music around when we were making the movie. To inspire us, you know, when we're doing very difficult sequences. I mean, we're doing sequences on a plantation, you know, in the South, where a lot of this stuff did happen, and there were very some very hard sequences for a lot of actors to do. And you know, he would play music loud and have everyone sort of feel a connection to one another. Or if there was, you know, something that was very sensitive to do on set, he'd play music aloud in between takes. It's a very unique, very unique set. Um, Tarantino said it's, it's kind of like a, has a little bit of a party atmosphere as well but you know there's nobody that works harder than him I mean he's uh, an incredible filmmaker. <音乐> 凭借诚恳的表演和无可挑剔的外表，迅速在同人院中崛起。You acting is doing so natural. When did you find out that okay, I want to do this. I'm good at it. My first memory, to be honest, was always to to want to be an actor. I remember my father. We were at downtown in L.A. and there was a concert that was going to go on, and I was two, three years old or something like that. And my father said to me, you know. 
everyone's waiting for the concert. You know, are you going to go do something? I said, yes. And I ran up on the stage and tried to dance. And I don't know what I was doing, but I was trying to get attention. <laughs> That's all I knew at that age. But I would constantly imitate all my all my uh, parents' friends. That's what I would do. The parent, the friends would come by, and I would do the imitations of them, and try to you know make my parents laugh. And and I I, I love that connection with them, and I love entertaining them. And you know I was the one that really, when I was twelve years old, my my stepbrother was an actor, he was doing commercials. <laughs> And I told my parents, I want to go do this too. I want to do this. And they're like, no, 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 go to school. I'm like, no, 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 you take me to auditions. So, you know, my parents, on the way back from school, we just start going on auditions. And so, so then our question is, when you go through an audition here, it's very brutal. They just reject you. You know, something. Have you gone through that? Some people they reject you. I think everyone goes through it. I have a lot of friends that I've grown up with this in this industry, and you know, the truth of the matter is. It's mainly rejection. You know, it is most most of the time you don't. It's it, it's, a, it's like winning the lottery to being a work to be a working actor consistently. It's very difficult. It's all about to me. You know, people ask me how it's happened for me, and the truth is, I think it's a lot to do with you know luck, timing, and being at the right place at the time, right time, but also being prepared for that. And、uh, I just always was incredibly motivated to do it. And that's the, the, some of the earliest stuff I remember was wanting wanting to do this for a living. When we look back, the performance you done there, and also the sports life, and later with、uh, eating goobers, the grip. At that young age, talk about the new performance was, was quite good. It's so hard to play a mental disabled、uh, team. You have no life experience to draw from, and you deliver that outstanding performance. I think it was nominated Oscar at that time. How did you? Deliver that performance at that young age, and it's very convincing. I well, I, I came from this boy's life, which was you know my first sort of major feature film and my entrance into、uh, the world of cinema. And I got to watch, you know, the great Robert De Niro work in front of me and, and see the work ethic that he had. But I'd always, I'd always wanted to, you know,、um, get my foot in the door. And I think the opportunity that I had then from going straight from this boy's life to Gilbert Grape was. You know, seeing that people like De Niro on set and seeing, you know, the the type of specificity that he used in his performances, you know, and and of course watching the myriad of different movies that I watched at that time, to, and everyone from Brando to Cliff to Dean to seeing all these guys and saying, "Wow, look at what these men have accomplished in cinema." And I remember at fifteen years old saying, "Someday in my life, I'm going to do something close to that good, hopefully." And 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 so I think with Gilbert Grape it was just a matter of seeing what De Niro did at, at sort of 16 years old and saying, you know, I'm going to go do the research that I have to do and, and put everything I possibly can into it. And so it, we were in Texas and I went to a home for mentally disabled children and spent like a week with them and created that character.、It、feels like such a long time ago. Well, it's like 21 years ago. At that young age, 20 million dollar investment. Gigantic sets, but the whole movie resides on the love story which you and Kate carried. How you handle that pressure and maintain the deep for the performance is Shelley experience on that. Kate and I talk about that experience a lot because we still remain close, and it's through our conversations together that I really recollect what <clears throat> that whole experience was. But you know, both of us had done just independent movies since then, and. For me, a lot of the reason was to be able to work with her. She was saying, "Look, I'm doing this role. I want you to do it too. Come on board." And I'm like, well, "I'd love to work with you."、And、we're both like, "Well, this is unlike anything we've ever ventured into. This is a different level of responsibility. This is a, you know, a, a, one of the most expensive films ever.、It、wasn't supposed to be the most expensive film ever made, but it turned out to be at that time.、Um, and it was, it was like going off to, you know, a far off. Distant place, even though it was close to my home, and 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 being enveloped in this entire world that was James Cameron's Titanic, and I think it it it, it definitely changed us for the better. We you know we we got to sort of experience the pinnacle of what that spectacle is, and、um, 
it was a tremendous amount of work. And but I don't think either of us realized what we were getting into, and or we, we never could have tapped into, never really realized how effective this movie would be as far as pulling audiences in worldwide. I mean the. the the way this film has reached out to every different country around the world is just astounding. It just blows our mind. And it's been a very fortunate situation for both of us because, you know, not only did we get to have that experience acting together, but we've gotten to sort of have a career that's been had longevity. Both of us have been able to choose the type of movies that we've wanted to choose since then. And we both both had that thing that's indelibly a part of our lives. 一夜红遍全球的莱昂纳多，经历了短暂的迷惘期，又重新找到人生方向。他没有沿着好莱坞绝大多数明星的道路向前走，而是跟自己扮演的角色一样偏执。拍片数量不多，极度挑剔剧本，只跟全世界最优秀的导演合作。在《泰坦尼克》之后的十六年的时间里，他彻底完成从一个青春偶像到实力派演员的蜕变。Made a lot of very good movies as a producer and a great artist. Do you feel the industry heading to the right direction, or we are a little bit away from the original reality of this story? What's going on? I, I, I would say that you know, actually, what I would say is this: this last year was had some really great movies, and I think that was as a result of the demand for seeing something a little different. But you have to understand, historically, there in this industry, there's ebbs and flows. It's like a wave. Like, you know, in the '60s was dominated by musicals. Then the '70s was the age of the of the director. Then the '80s was the age of of you know the the sort of big box office spectacle films. And then the '90s was something different. And even in the 2000s, uh, you know, there was a so sort of a more of a upheaval of of um, Independent films, and then that died down. I think we're in the age right now where film, those sort of independent market, where there used to be a middle ground. There's only really small movies or really large movies, but there's you know it's because a lot of the studios aren't making some of those movies now. A lot of independent financiers have gone out and said, "I want to see this movie," and there's been a demand from audiences, and a lot of them have been doing well. So I think that it's actually starting to change again, but. I would certainly say now, in reference to the Aviator, I, I don't think I'd be able to make that movie right now, uh, or a film like Blood Diamond. I mean, the film, the age of of making movies that um, are you know ninety or a hundred million dollar budgets or something insane like that, that are about you know、uh, diamonds in Africa or a obsessive or compulsive billionaire, they don't really finance those movies right now, and those that's why. A lot of people are sort of going outside of the industry and trying to get private financing to to get a lot of these films made. Another one, the Blood Diamond, the South African accent. It's a very authentic. How did you pull that off? Also, at the end of the movie, the scene, it's touching. How、uh, you prepare for that? That journey was another film where we were off in Africa for six months with the great German Hansu, and I, and I needed. To me, it was such a foreign land to me. It was like something that's so isolated from anything I've ever experienced. It was just about being with the locals and 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 really talking to a lot of these ex-military guys that were in those conflict zones, hearing their not not just their the way they spoke, but their attitude about life and their heart, how hardened they were, how sort of、um, emotionally, you know.、Um, How emotionally damaged they were, and thank God they spent some time with me, and I got to,、um, you know, work on that character with them. I interviewed him, Martin Scorsese last year or something. To me, he's not just a director; he's more like a Picasso or Monet to film.、Mm-hmm. Uh, would you share a little bit、uh, what he's like? There's people that have a passion for filmmaking, and the, there are those, you know, like Quentin as well. I think Quentin, in in one perspective, is, you know. Incredibly knowledgeable of the sort of pulp and B film world, whereas Marty is sort of the expert in, in classic films. But these men combined are, you know, the greatest cinema database you could ever <laughs> encounter. And Marty, in particular, I think he's seen every film ever made up until 1980. I mean, he is a cinephile. He is a professor of cinema, and. He appreciates this art form, and in a way that most people don't. 
And this is what he does all day long when he's not working. He still watches movies. Filmmaking and film is an art form. To him, it's the most transcendent sort of art form there is. And he is, you know, he is one of those people that should be, you know, celebrated while they're here because there's no one like him. There is, he is the great filmmaker of our time. I feel like I didn't have the fortune to meet the Seiko of Fellini, but I'm so lucky to have a chance to meet him, which is unbelievable. I would have loved to meet Fellini as well. One of my favorite new movies is Aviator. I just, I can't stop that. Howard Hughes is very multi-dimensional people, and you need to deal with the challenge of both physically and mentally. I just, surprised. Thank you for saying that, because that's actually one of, that's my favorite movie that I've ever done, I think. I, you know, partly because I had such a passion to play him. It was a, I picked up a book on his life in my mid-twenties, and I said, "This, how has this not become a movie? So it was like an eight-year process to get the script right. Michael Mann was involved at one time, and I think he went to go do, he went to go do uh, Ali, and then I was lucky enough to take the script and say, look, I've developed this for eight years. Mr. Scorsese, will you do it? And, you know, I had the relationship with him from, Gangs in New York, and, and I was incredibly lucky to have him be the director of the film. But I, that was a very big turning point for me as an actor because I think it was the first time that I felt truly responsible for something. This was nobody else's. This was like something that I was bringing to one of the greatest directors in the world, and I had to, I was a producer, and it was, so it was there was a different sort of um, it's just a different feeling of intensity for me and it, it made me sort of um, I don't want to say direct I had nothing to do with the directing but I was integrated with all parts of that movie for the first time I was not just an actor for hire I was responsible for a lot of different things <laughs> Mm-hmm.